Good evening, everybody. It is eight o'clock. We are really excited to um, run this webinar with you guys tonight. We have a nice big announcement as well on the webinar. Um, I'm tempted to give just one more minute for people to kind of show up um, and let everyone get settled and then we'll get going. All right, I think we're still having a few people arrive. If you are just arriving, welcome. We're just about to start the webinar, so you are not late. Um, thank you for joining us tonight. I know after a long weekend, it can feel like it can feel like we're still on the long weekend, but um, and I know there's lots of things people can do with their evenings, but we really appreciate you joining us. And um, this has been a topic that we've been wanting to cover for a while, and uh, we are really looking forward to running through this presentation, sharing a lot of fantastic information about IVF, its history, um, and difference between chronologic age and ovarian age, and a lot of really fantastic information. Um, I'll introduce myself. My name is Melissa McInerney, and I'm going to be the moderator for tonight. So my role is to handle questions as they come in. We really like these webinars to be engaging, and they're here for you to get awesome value. So if you have any questions, you're going to see a little questions area on your GoToWebinar control panel. You can type in a question right in there, and I will do my best to kind of peek inside of um, Dr. John McNaught's presentation, and you know we'll just answer questions as best we can and slip them perfectly inside of certain areas. And any questions we don't get to, we will uh, try to address at the very end of the presentation or we will answer them by email, but we really love the questions and they make a really big difference for everybody on the call. So um, please you know, pose any questions that you do have any time along the way. Um, also, everyone is currently muted and we do that because it just makes the webinar run a little bit smoother and it's a lot quieter and um, we don't get as much feedback. So um, there's not really gonna be any discussions back and forth, but that's where we're gonna have you know, that's where if you do have questions, please use that question box and, um, and we will answer them as best we can. And you are more than welcome to get really comfortable. Myself, I always have some tea. I also have some chocolates with me tonight. So just get comfortable, relax. Nobody's going to, you know, hear any of your conversations, um, which is one of the awesome benefits of running webinars. Let me just introduce you to Dr. John McNaught. Um, Dr. John McNaught is the medical director at Fertility Ontario, and that's in here in London, Ontario. He's extremely passionate, passionate about his career, and he loves helping people build their family. He does a lot of outreach through social media and his website, and has greatly enjoyed our successful webinar campaign over the past few months. So without further ado, welcome Dr. John McNaught. Thanks, Melissa. You're welcome. So tonight, um, we're talking about a topic that generates lots of questions for people. Um, over the past several months, we've been talking about a lot of um, holistic approaches to family building, like natural fertility, um, healthy eating and metabolism, um, enhancing male fertility. But tonight, we're going to deal with something that is a little bit more technical, and that's in vitro fertilization. The prospect of IVF, either needing it or attempting to access it can be very daunting for people. And we find that when folks have an opportunity to have their questions answered, they fare a lot better through the process. It's also Canadian Infertility Awareness Week, and we want to take the opportunity to educate people about IVF and educate people about infertility awareness. Um, because one of the things that we're working towards is greater access to the best fertility care for as many Canadians as possible. And at the end of our presentation, we're going to be talking about the Blue Sky Project, which is 
the most exciting venture we have put forth since we started our clinic. We think it's going to help a lot of people as well as raise awareness, which is what this week is all about. So Fertility Awareness Week seemed like the ideal time to both do this webinar and launch the Blue Sky Project. Slide. So we're going to talk tonight very briefly about the history of in vitro fertilization. As a couple of months ago, we marked the passing of Dr. Bob Edwards, the pioneer of the technique. Then I'd like to spend the bulk of the presentation talking about how IVF works and giving you an open forum to ask as many questions as you need. Finally, we're going to unveil the Blue Sky Project, talk about what it could mean for families, and talk about the larger goals associated with the project. And that's something that we're all very excited about. And um, I, I, I may go a little bit quickly through my presentation tonight because I'm so excited to tell you about the Blue Sky Project. So let's get started. All right. So in vitro fertilization, the, the concept of taking an egg outside of the ovary, bypassing the fallopian tube, and fertilizing an egg with sperm in a laboratory was developed in the mid-1970s by Dr. Robert Edwards and Dr. Patrick Steptoe in Great Britain. Dr. Edwards, who passed recently, was awarded the Nobel Prize for Medicine in 2010 for developing the technique. Slide. This is Louise Brown, who met with Dr. Edwards, shortly before his passing in this photo, she was born on July 25, 1978 and delivered by a cesarean section, which the doctor attended. And what people, you know, she's a sort of a household name in the fertility world. What people don't know a lot about is her parents and what they went through. They had actually been suffering with infertility for over nine years prior to the birth of Louise. And so for her family, and for now Louise's family, the development of in vitro fertilization was, was you know, quite literally a life giver. Next slide. So I wanted to take the opportunity um, to just say a respectful thank you to Dr. Edwards for developing the technique. Since its inception, over 5 million babies have been born worldwide from IVF, and it remains a tremendous asset to people who are struggling with infertility. Um, in our community, we, you know, some of the people who were present in that generation know what Edwards and Steptoe went through. Um, they would wake in the middle of the night. They did their egg retrievals laparoscopically. They measured blood values on their patients every two hours, always trying to catch the elusive mature egg. And they weren't very successful at first. The first IVF cycle was essentially a natural IVF cycle, which is coming into vogue a little bit more now. But at its outset, IVF really only had about a 1-2% to chance of success. These guys came from very humble beginnings and hard work. And the people like me who have the ability to make a career out of this industry um, owe a huge debt to these pioneers. Slide. So I, I would like to spend the majority of the presentation talking about how IVF works and I'm sure some of you are familiar with it and what goes on. Um, I, I am one of those people who just likes to keep things as simple as possible. And that's how I'm going to try to present it to you. Um, I'm certainly not dumbing it down. Uh, there are a lot of nuances and, and uh, variations for in vitro fertilization. But if we can break it down to its core, its core elements, 
I think patients understand it better. And when patients understand a process better, they tend to do better in that process. Slide. So today, IVF has a far greater success rate than the 1% to 2% that Dr. Edwards started out with. Um, when I counsel people about in vitro fertilization, I do my best to sort of break things down into its core components. As I said, I think it makes it easier to understand. Slide. So in order to have successful IVF, these are the building blocks that we need. Number one is proper counseling and education. And, and that's something that's actually mandated by the government in Canada because we really feel that this process is stressful enough that people should be well prepared before even beginning the process. The second is something we refer to as suppression, which involves introducing some sort of hormonal signal that keeps the ovaries from ovulating so that we have the ability to grow multiple eggs rather than just the one to two that are normally produced in a natural cycle. Stimulation refers to the injection of FSH and sometimes LH to grow the follicles. And when we introduce FSH to a suppressed ovary, we can generally get that ovary to produce many more eggs than it would in a natural cycle. When the eggs are mature, that's when we proceed to egg retrieval. Egg retrieval is followed by the two different forms of fertilization, either IVF or ICSI. And then three to five days of culture or incubation in these very, very, very expensive laboratories that some of you have already been inside of. Once we have a good quality embryo, we move on to embryo transfer. And then the final two weeks of the process is supporting that embryo as best as possible. Slide. So counseling and education is something I think a lot of people just want to get through. But we find that when our patients participate in either meeting with a social worker or a psychologist who's trained in IVF, they you can sort of feel like this immense sigh of relief that comes from them because they've had the opportunity to talk to somebody about the things that are stressing them, um, to you know lay out the things that are, are they're afraid of that they don't understand, and you know talk with other family members sometimes about ways to cope and ways to be successful. In the past, I think people have, have sort of felt like the counseling session was some sort of, of judgment of their fitness to be parents, and it is really no such thing. It, it's an opportunity for people to access resources that will help them decrease stress, both mentally and, and physically as well. A lot of our therapists treat, teach great relaxation techniques that help people get through invasive procedures. And this this step is so important that we actually we don't allow people to go through an IVF cycle until it's completed. Next slide. So we talk about suppression. I know a lot of you are IVF veterans. Suppression refers to the ways that we can keep the ovaries from ovulating until they're mature enough to ovulate. So the hormones that control ovarian function are located in the hypothalamus. Um, typically, they will release the hormones that stimulate the ovary. And the brain is constantly assessing the bloodstream for feedback from the ovaries. Next slide. The feedback is in the form of estrogen. So the brain, the hypothalamus, can't count. It doesn't know whether you have one egg developing, two eggs developing, or in the case of IVF, whether or not you have 10 to 12 eggs developing at one time. 
what the brain does sense is the amount of estrogen in your bloodstream. And when that value hits about a thousand or so, which each passing day, there's an increased chance of what we call an LH surge or the physiologic mechanism that matures the egg for release. The problem with this is that when we're trying to create a number of eggs or follicles rather than just one to two, we reach that threshold amount at a point where the eggs are still very small and immature. So if the brain had its way and ovulated those eggs early, the cycle would be a complete disaster. So suppression is very important but because it allows us the time and control to grow eggs properly. There are different ways of achieving suppression. One of the most commonly used is what people call the long protocol, where we shut down the hypothalamus first, and once the hypothalamus is shut down, then we bring on stimulation. The one that I employ more commonly is what's called the short protocol, where stimulation is allowed to occur for four to five days, before we bring on a medication that suppresses the hypothalamus. There are pros and cons to both approaches, and I would be happy to discuss them during the question period. Slide. So stimulation is something that I think um, IVF veterans are very familiar with. Um, they have to inject themselves pretty much on a daily basis with either recombinant or highly purified follicle stimulating hormone which may or may not have some LH activity in it as well and typically what we're trying to do is create a stronger a stronger and more prolonged signal than what the brain produces and that way we can produce multiple follicles rather than just one to two you might be wondering why we need so many eggs well it comes down to basic probability. If we only retrieve one egg and we only create one embryo, we put a tremendous amount of pressure and anticipation on a single embryo. We certainly know from natural fertility that not every embryo that is created becomes a pregnancy. So ovarian hyperstimulation or injecting with FSH allows us to create many chances for pregnancy out of a, signal, a single cycle. And that's really where IVF gets a lot of its therapeutic benefit. Slide. So what I'm going to show you now is, is how we monitor stimulation, um, what it looks like from, from our perspective. This is somebody that I did earlier this month. Um, she was a long protocol, which is something I don't do a lot of. But you can see that this is the ovary here, and it's suppressed and small. The small black spaces within it are what we call antral-sized follicles. And when the estrogen level is low and the follicles are small, we know that the ovary is ready to accept stimulation. Once stimulation has begun, we use an internal ultrasound like the one that captured this image to monitor the follicle sizes and at the same time we're doing blood analysis for estrogen, luteinizing hormone and progesterone. Next slide. So this is the same ovary, same cycle a week later and you can see that that ovary has grown to four times its initial size. The follicle sizes recorded in this picture are about 1.4 centimeters in largest diameter. Um, some of them are a little bit bigger than that. But I look at a scan like this and I know that the patient isn't ready. There's a correlation between follicle size and maturity of the oocyte. And only mature oocytes or mature eggs will fertilize normally. So if we trigger the process too quickly, we won't get as many mature embryos. 
we aim to grow the biggest follicles to about 18 to 20 millimeters before triggering maturation. In the short protocol, this usually takes about 10 days of stimulation. In the long protocol, this will often take 12 days of stimulation. Next slide. When we've decided that things are ready, and that decision is, is, is something that we, you know, we don't have a mathematical algorithm for. It's, it's sort of a, an instinctive feeling sometimes because we can only take all of the eggs at the same time. You can't retrieve them in stages. Um, this HCG trigger takes the place of luteinizing hormone because HCG is several times um, more potent in terms of its LH activity than LH itself. And what happens is it matures both the egg and its surrounding supporting cells, which are called the cumulus, and they expand and amplify to the point that they can be fertilized by sperm. The timing of this HCG trigger is extremely important. Number one, we need to pick the day of stimulation that is going to catch the follicles at their peak and maximize the number of mature eggs that are retrieved. It's also a very time sensitive process. Particularly when we're employing ICSI, we find that we generally need at least 36 hours to have optimal fertilization. So typically what we'll do is if your retrieval is booked on a Thursday at 9 a.m., we'll have you take your HCG trigger the preceding Tuesday at 9 p.m. And that gives us 34 to 36 hours to properly mature the follicles before we retrieve them. Next slide. I find this slide funny, but I have a weird sense of humor. Um, methods of egg retrieval have obviously evolved over time. We talked about Dr. Edwards and Dr. Steptoe and them waking in the middle of the night to go in with a laparoscope to retrieve a single egg. That honestly and truly is how IVF began. These days, patients tend to be awake during their egg retrieval. They have some IV narcotic available to them. They're under a, a procedure that we call conscious sedation. And now, rather than putting a camera inside the belly, we do an endovaginal ultrasound and retrieve the eggs through a fine needle. Slide. This is a picture of um, an egg retrieval. This is actually a video. Um, Mel, can you try clicking on the video one time? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, try that. No, I think it's just, I think it's just registering as a picture. That's fine. Um, basically what you can see is the, the white line at the base has sort of um, a needle hash on it that allows the surgeon to move about within the ovary. It's obviously worked better as a video, but what we do is we pierce this needle directly into the follicle and we watch the fluid drain out under ultrasound guidance. Once the follicle is drained, we then move on to the next follicle until they're all drained. We will sometimes leave some behind if they're very small because they're unlikely to contain a mature egg, but we try to get everything that is there. That's why the timing is so crucial is because we only get one shot and we need to make it a good one. Next slide. This is what the eggs look like in our laboratory after they've been retrieved. So those are the fluffy cloud-like substance around the egg is the cumulus complex and the dark dot in the middle is the actual egg. And this um, microscope will be about 800 times magnification. So they're still very, very small. And we have to hunt through the fluid in order to find them. Next slide. From there, we will have made a choice ahead of time as to whether to do in vitro fertilization, which involves exposing those eggs to sperm 
for 24 hours in a petri dish or intracytoplasmic sperm injection which involves the microinjection of a single sperm into an egg. These are very different processes. Typically, ICSI is used for people who have severe male factor, where we're not certain if fertilization will occur without injection, or sometimes in patients who have severe endometriosis, where the outside layer of the, the egg is hardened. And some people just want to ensure that they get fertilization and so they'll employ ICSI on an elective basis. Up until this point, the two processes are identical. The fertilization process is different, but once they go back into culture, the process again becomes identical. Next slide. So from there, the eggs will hang out in our laboratory for three to five days. These laboratories are highly controlled environments. They have sensors within the incubators that assess temperature, pH, PCO2, and there is a constant assessment of the developing embryos. We typically look at them at least once a day, although some people have gotten away from, from looking on various days so as to not interrupt the process. But what you find is that on day three, you're going to have what's called an you know, typically a cleavage stage embryo where anything between six to ten cells is normal. And this is where we used to traditionally return the embryo back into the uterus. And we still do that somewhat. But more often we're getting to day five transfers, which is the blastocyst that you see on the right there. And a blastocyst is a very advanced embryo that has so many cells in it that we're not able to count and it started to sort of collapse and cavitate into the, the early beginnings of an implanting pregnancy. The reason that we've been going more to the blastocyst stage is that it improves our ability to choose the best embryo. Um, embryos that make it to blastocyst tend to have higher rates of implantation. So when we want to improve the outcome, and particularly when we're doing single embryo transfer, development of the blastocyst stage is hugely beneficial. Now, if we're comfortable that we've already had our best embryos selected, and we, we know on day three that there are one or two that are clearly better than all the others, we'll still transfer on day three with an eight cell or, or a seven cell embryo. But when there's a large number of embryos to choose from, Blastocyst culture helps our lab to determine which embryo has the highest chance of becoming a pregnancy. Next slide. So embryo transfer, um, one or two embryos. I, I, I personally will not transfer more than two embryos, um, regardless of the circumstance. It would be transferred under ultrasound guidance. And this is a very comfortable procedure unlike egg retrieval, doesn't require any medications, it's very quick, and it's comparable to having a pap smear performed. Now, despite the fact that it's quick and doesn't require a lot of technology, this is definitely the most delicate portion of the procedure, and we need to be very careful not to irritate the uterus as the embryos are replaced. Embryo transfer and the way that the uterus behaves around embryo transfer is actually an area of intense study in IVF right now. We're trying to identify the ideal conditions to replace an embryo, particularly from the frozen state. So you're going to be hearing more about that over the next couple of years, where we're going to become much more strict about the elective conditions that we'll transfer an embryo under. And if we feel that the uterus is not a hospitable place for the developing embryo, more and more there's an argument to cryopreserve the embryos and put them back when we've optimized the uterus. It's an area of hot debate, but you'll be hearing about it over the next few years. Next slide. So I briefly mentioned cryopreservation, and, and realistically this is a webinar all to its own because the freezing techniques have become so amazing now that we're seeing a high survival rate 
with not only the freezing of embryos, but also the freezing of eggs and the freezing of sperm. So this opens up a lot of options for people trying to build a family, um, as well as people who are trying to preserve their fertility. If you would have asked me five years ago if it was possible to freeze somebody's eggs, I would have said no. I knew that the procedure was investigational, but it had really crummy results. These days, using a technique called vitrification, which is a rapid freeze that doesn't damage cells, the survival rate of frozen embryos is very high, and the, fro the survival rate of frozen eggs is very high as well. So being able to cryopreserve embryos, cryopreserve eggs, and ship them from one center to another, sometimes from one country to another, is one of the ways that access to effective fertility care is going to be increased over the next decade. Next slide. Finally, and this is the, you know, the less um, interesting portion because this is the part that's done after you leave the IVF clinic. When you're at home on pins and needles waiting for the result, you still have to do the two or three times a day vaginal suppositories of that ooey gooey progesterone that we put you on. A lot of people ask, well, why do we need to do that? And it's because we've damaged the luteal support from the ovary, both through downregulation and physical trauma to the ovary during the egg retrieval. So if we didn't supplement it with pharmacologic progesterone, the embryo wouldn't have an adequate lining in order to implant and grow. So luteal support is something that people gloss over quite a bit, but it's every bit as crucial as the other steps in the process. Next slide. And about two weeks after the procedure, we do a hormone test called the beta-HCG. And if it's positive, we keep you on your progesterone and book an early ultrasound. Success is something that is talked about quite a bit in the IVF world in terms of rates of success, individual success. I, I think going forward, we need to redefine what it is to be successful in fertility therapy. We know that as we become more responsible with IVF and we transfer less embryos, the pregnancy per embryo transfer is expected to go down. And that's actually happened in the province of Quebec where they funded IVF therapy for everybody. What has gone down as well, and we talked about this in April's webinar, is the rates of multiple pregnancy associated with double embryo transfer. And so Quebec might be the new model of success for fertility therapy, where the patient meets their goal of building a family without incurring the risk both to themselves as well as to society. So things are constantly evolving. And one of the reasons I don't talk about success rates very much is I feel that they're intensely individual. They vary from quarter to quarter and from clinic to clinic. And it seems like every time you are perusing a website for an IVF clinic, they claim to have the best pregnancy rates in either the province or in the country. Um, there was actually an interesting news documentary last year about six different IVF clinics in the province who all claim to have the highest pregnancy rate. And it just goes to show that, you know, in a highly competitive industry, everyone wants to be viewed as the best. I would suggest that it's time for us to reconsider what it is to be successful and redefine the goals that we set as we go through fertility therapy. Next slide. So IVF obviously has its risks. Um, it's invasive particularly if you compare it to other forms of fertility therapy. It causes an intense amount of stress. The common medical condition that is talked about is ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, although in modern fertility therapy that's not something that we see a lot of anymore. Um, we have ways to prevent it or, or to mitigate it, so we don't see a lot of OHSS anymore. Multiple birth is definitely the one that is, is talked about at great length. And um, that's the way that the system can save money 
by regulating and funding fertility therapy. When there's a smaller number of embryos transferred, the risks of multiple birth will go down and the burden to the taxpayer in a funded system will be lessened by an amount that would be more than enough to fund fertility therapy. If you missed our webinar last month called Foolish Decisions, please look it up on YouTube. Um, Dr. Jeff Nisker did a great job of outlining that. Carrie Stanford from Conceivable Dreams did a fantastic job as well. Um, this is something that I am very passionate about. I believe that this is the future of fertility therapy and um, that's one of the things we're going to be talking about with the Blue Sky Project. Next slide. And then the barriers to IVF treatments, one of them is education. You know, you, you may have made a conscious decision not to pursue this therapy because you didn't feel like you had your questions answered with regards to what might go on. Um, geography is a huge issue. If you live in northern Ontario, it's much harder to find an IVF clinic than in downtown Toronto where there are many of them are side by side like a Starbucks. Um, some people have medical contraindications to IVF treatment such that the risk to their health doesn't justify the procedure. But over and over and over again, what we find is that the barrier to treatment is cost, cost and cost. In a non-funded system, the number that is frequently quoted is $10,000 per cycle. And very few people in Ontario are truly funded in terms of access to in vitro fertilization. The, when we look at the major barriers to treatment that works for people, we we understand the cultural implications, the education piece, and geography, but I truly believe that it comes down to financial resources. And that's what we're going to be talking about with the Blue Sky Project. Next slide. Okay, so I burned through my initial presentation because this is, this is what I really want to talk about tonight. Um, those of you who were with us last month and heard the presentation by Dr. Nisker and Carrie know how much injustice exists with respect to access to fertility care in Canada. Infertility is a medically recognized disorder by the World Health Organization. And in Canada, we're supposed to have access to universal health care. Quebec has shown massive savings after only a brief period of time with funding in vitro fertilization and putting guidelines in place to limit the number of embryos that are transferred. And um, Yves Bolduc, the former health minister, in an interview this week, anticipates that they will save 50 to 60 million dollars per year by funding in vitro fertilization. The Blue Sky Project is something that we developed at the end of a philanthropic, philanthropic campaign called Laura's Wish. I don't know if any of you remember the Laura's Wish campaign, but we had a small amount of money donated to our clinic by a deceased woman who went, who struggled with infertility and about two months after she gave birth to her miracle baby, she passed away from medical complications of pregnancy. So to honor her memory, we did a several months long campaign where we took applications from families and eventually selected three families who would receive a fully funded cycle of in vitro fertilization similar to what was available in the province of Quebec. I was initially quite pleased with the program. Um, eventually, when we called everybody and, and made the announcements and made arrangements, 
I just sort of felt very empty about the process because we had over 120 strong applications for the program and we simply couldn't help everybody. And I went from feeling very proud and, and kind of elated to feeling like we could never possibly do enough. And that that's really where I decided that it was time to do everything we could as a clinic to make a difference. Next slide. So we know how stressful it is for people to consider the financial obligations of IVF, to think if they have enough money for one cycle or possibly two. And we know that the decisions that they make with regards to embryo transfer are always centered on just trying to be successful. In the moment, they just want to reach their goal, and that goal is viewed as a pregnancy, whether it be singles or twins, even triplets, people really just want to become pregnant. The concept behind the Blue Sky Project is we are going to lower the cost of access to IVF and partner with the patient for socially responsible fertility therapy. So essentially what we've done is we've negotiated the lowest price that we can with a couple of different IVF laboratories. We have purchased medications in bulk at the lowest price we could negotiate. And from a physician standpoint, I'm going to be providing my services pro bono for the program. In return, the expectation is that the patient understands we are going to stick to the guidelines for reducing multiple pregnancy. Now that doesn't mean single embryo transfer for everybody because people who are you know 38 and 39 years old the guidelines still say that it's reasonable to transfer two embryos. But what I can tell you, and this is available um, on our ebook uh, on our website, is that patients less than 35 will only be getting a single embryo. And there's both a short and a long-term slide process at place here. We want to help people in the short term. We want to, you know, find people who could not afford IVF or who want to pay less for IVF and give them a high quality service at a drastically reduced rate. The larger purpose of the program, which we're going to be running for a full year until Mother's Day 2014, is to illustrate to the Ontario government that subsidizing or funding fertility therapy makes sense. We will probably do something in the neighborhood of 200 cycles over that year, but it will be enough results to provide some economic analysis that to say in one clinic in London, Ontario, by simply lowering the cost of access, we saved the system millions in terms of the burden of multiple pregnancy. So we see it as a win for the patient because you're going to pay a lot less for effective therapy. We see it as a win for our clinic because we're going to be doing what we feel is right and also a win for society because the costs associated with multiple birth in our, in our small little microcosm are going to be decreased. And the hope is that the Blue Sky Project is going to help us to create a new opportunity and a new day for people who are struggling. The long-term goal is to get the government in Ontario, government in Alberta, Manitoba, BC, to do the exact same thing that Quebec did, and that is to truly make Canadian healthcare universal. Slide. <laughs> so if you want to learn more about the Blue Sky Project, you can go to fertilityontario.com, and in the About section, you'll see our um, sub page for the Blue Sky Project as well as an accompanying ebook. Um, you can download it for details. Um, the pricing is in there. The, you know, 
if you examine the the different price structure you'll see that you're going to be saving about 40 percent off of the cost of treatment overall um, and all you know the only expectation in return is that people do the right thing when it comes to transferring embryos so I'm really excited about this I think it's going to be something that is going to be a game changer in the province and and really highlight where we need to go both as a province as a, and as a country I'm excited to work with my patients and and to create good outcomes for people and really change what it means to be a successful IVF clinic. Next slide. Okay, any questions? We do have some questions. Um, I have a question. I know that I can see some familiar, familiar names from our previous webinar and there's a whole bunch of new names too. Do you mind maybe for people going into you know, a little bit more of, say, the costs, you know, like what happens if there's double embryo transfer or even more? You know, how does, why does the government, you know, care so much about that? And how, if we only send, you know, how if we only do one embryo, is that going to help the Canadian government? Well, the thing is that when you transfer more than one embryo, the chances of multiple pregnancy are, are very high. Um, multiple births, have a very high rate of prematurity. So those children tend to end up in special care nurseries. Um, they have a higher proportion of developmental disabilities. So both in a hospital setting in the NICU as, as well as the, the implications after the child is growing up, you know, it's anticipated or there was a government report three, from three years ago and this was condition, uh, commissioned by um, the government of Ontario, they estimated that by decreasing the rates of multiple birth, the government could save $550 million over 10 years by funding in vitro fertilization. The sad state of affairs is that despite the fact that very few people question that math, no action has been taken. And, and that's really what we're, we're trying to do is, is get the government to take action, make people aware, and get people to take notice. Got it. Got it. We have some great comments coming in from people. Um, you know, Catherine says that she's really proud to be a patient at Fertility Ontario. You know, she, she says that this is going to change people's lives and open huge doors. It really is. This is, this is a really fantastic program. And... Um, I can't wait to see where we're going to be in one year from now just to see the results that this has produced and really be able to give some hard facts to the government and, you know, maybe really change the game forever. That's what we're hoping. I mean, we, we feel like the government is sort of on the brink. Um, they're watching Quebec very closely. Um, Quebec has some great data. Um, they're they're re-evaluating re the Quebec situation right now. Um, you know, what it takes is constant awareness, constant pressure, really keeping the question in the public eye so that the people can experience what it means to be a fertility patient, to understand the greater implications of the fertility epidemic throughout North America and understand why funding makes sense. It's, I mean, if, if you can't compel people just from the, you know, the basic reason that we, we should want to help one another, they should look at the the decrease in tax burden as seeing it making sense from a dollars and cents standpoint. Awesome. Awesome. We have a whole ton of questions here. Um, I will ask Angie's question first because she was the first to ask a question. She is asking if IVF or ICSI, um, are those procedures done at Fertility Ontario? Um, and if it is, is it done at the London Health Sciences Centre? In conjunction with the London Health Sciences Center? Yeah, we, we do our procedures at London Health Sciences Center. Um, we also, we work with another IVF laboratory in Mississauga from time to time, but the vast majority of our procedures are done at London Health Sciences Center. The, um, the LHSC Fertility Clinic is a funded center, so that's one of the ways that we're able to decrease the cost associated with IVF is um, because there's infrastructure shared with the hospital, 
there doesn't seem to be as much of a, a burden as you get with private clinics. Um, so we're hoping that if we can maintain our cost structure with London Health Sciences Center, we can maintain the program. Great. Great. We have a question here from Alvin, and it's, does your clinic offer mini IVF? And actually, there's two questions here. And do you have a maximum age for admitting patients? Um, mini IVF, we do do some low stimulation protocols. Um, we do, yeah, there's something I, 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 I cannot talk about right now because we're still um, in the midst of a clinical trial. Um, but in the next few months, we will be unrolling an IVF alternative that is very interesting. Um, I guess stay tuned on that. Um, what was the other question? Oh, with respect to age, you know, I don't refuse anybody um, treatment on the basis of either age, culture, ethnicity, sexual orientation. If, if I feel like somebody has a barrier that is going to keep them from being successful, then, then typically I will advise that they not go through treatment. Um, you know, I, had, I saw somebody today who was 46 years old and, um, you know, IVF never came up because in our IVF laboratory we have never been successful at achieving a healthy pregnancy in a 46-year-old patient. Um, we'll still do natural fertility therapy with such a patient and, and, you know, do what we can. But in a lot of ways it's my job to give people good counsel. And I don't, you know, if I feel somebody is wasting their money, I will generally advise them not to pursue. Got it. Got it. This is a question from Mary. She's saying, can you ovulate sooner than the 34 to 36 hours after the trigger shot? And if yes, how often does that happen? Well, it, it does happen. Um, that's why the timing is so crucial. It, um, if, if things are, are properly timed and the suppression is effective, it doesn't happen very frequently in, in the order of maybe one or two times per year. Um, the, if the eggs ovulate themselves, they're very difficult to retrieve. Um, sometimes they'll actually be scattered throughout the pelvis, which makes their retrieval almost impossible. So it really, you know, we always say if, if there's one step that you can screw up it's the HCG trigger and it seems like such a benign sort of end to the process but it's actually the most crucial so that's why you know the education piece is so important we really want people to know what they're getting into and you know I don't give patients their injections they take them by themselves at home so you know it's a, it's an area of medicine where you're a lot more responsible for your care than you might be in other situations and, um, you know, the injections aren't hard, but their timing is crucial. Great. We have a question here from Leah. I hope I'm saying that right. Um, with someone with severe endometriosis, stage four, and fibroids, what are the chances of one embryo transfer being successful? Well, you see, in somebody who, like, if you have severe endometriosis and if there's a lot of fibroid change to the uterus, um, you know, the guidelines for single embryo transfer would allow for double embryo transfer if the prognosis was somewhat guarded. So, you know, the guidelines are not carved in stone. Um, you have to evaluate your particular situation. You know, if, if someone was very young, like 28 years old, I, I would still say that, you know, if we could get you to a, a blastocyst or a day five embryo, a well-formed blastocyst in a young patient, um, transferring two versus one doesn't really change the pregnancy rate that much. That's a difficult concept for people to get their heads around, but really, you know, you, you want to increase success, but balance it with increasing risk. Um, with severe endometriosis, if you really want to change your outcome, you need to medically treat the endometriosis prior to going through IVF. So hopefully your REI physician has put you on something like Lupron for three to six months before going through IVF because that's really the best way to enhance outcomes. 
great. We have a really interesting question from Amanda. She says, if you put two eggs back and they turn into two sets of twins, does that happen? Um, yeah, yeah. I, you know, like I've, um, I, I've had a situation where, you know, I put three embryos back into a patient and, um, she ended up having quadruplets and, um, she had to make a very difficult decision to reduce the number of pregnancies that were on board. So sort of selectively reduce two of the fetuses so that the other two would have a chance to survive. And um, that was, you know, although those, those kids are healthy today, um, that was one of the worst outcomes of my career because I never wanted to put somebody in the position to have to make a decision like that. So, you know, my policy now is to never transfer more than two embryos, regardless of the situation, because it's cases like that that just remind me that it's not worth it. For that extra five to six percentage points in pregnancy, the, the risk that you incur doesn't justify it. Mm -hmm. We have a question here from Nikki. She says, how does weight affect the success of IVF? Well, you know, when we look at our data, typically it's, um, you know, it's based on body mass index. And if you get up to a BMI of about 37, we start to see the outcomes in IVF decrease significantly. I think some of that is um, in conjunction with the absorption of the medications that we need. So people who have more, because all of the injections are sub-Q, um, we, we might be able to help people a little bit better if we can get the medication to be absorbed better. But I really need people to work with me to do their best to optimize their weight and their metabolism before going through IVF. And typically, like all I'm asking of people is three or four months. And if you can work hard for three or four months before going through a cycle, you can go from somebody who has a you know less than optimal outcome to somebody who has a good outcome. And you know that's worth the work. And if you're going to spend the money, you should really be doing your best to not only you know improve your outcome but improve yourself. And um, that's something that we will work with our patients on. It's uh, it's hard work, but it's worth it. That's great. We have a question here from Melissa. She says, generally speaking, what is the total time estimate for one cycle of IVF and how soon after it is determined a couple, how soon is it determined a couple are candidates for IVF can treatment begin? Um, so once somebody, you know, is, has met with their doctor and chosen IVF as their next step, the first thing that we do is arrange an orientation which will usually involve meeting with the nurse and discussing medications and then meeting with the counselor afterwards to um, talk about um, support systems and sign consents. That's sort of the rate limiting step. So if, if somebody came to me today and said, you know, I want to go through in vitro fertilization and we had decided that that was the next best, best, best step, then I um, will refer them on for orientation which typically will take about six weeks or so. Once, uh, six weeks for the appointment, not the entire process. And once they've had their orientation process, they can start right away. Um, currently, our, our waiting list is not more than three months. That's great. We have a few more. So we have some questions that are, are about the Blue Sky Project, and I have those, and I'm just kind of saving those up for the end. And I'm just going through some of the more technical questions here. Um, we have a question from Julie. She's saying, what are the benefits of IVF with someone who has had multiple miscarriages? Oh, that's a loaded question. Um, there isn't anything about the actual process that lessens your chance for miscarriage. Um, being able to watch the embryos in culture will sometimes help you to identify which embryo is best. Um, there's also the possibility, if you've had a lot of miscarriages, to do what's called um, 
pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, sample some of the cells from the embryo and determine which ones have a normal chromosome complement. Um, that would be the, the biggest benefit of, of using IVF because that's the only way that you can get a cell biopsy. But the procedure itself is not really a treatment for recurrent pregnancy loss. Great. Um, we have a question here from Mary. Do most women who do an IVF cycle have extra embryos that can be frozen for a second transfer down the road? Yes. Yeah. The um, we don't, you know, we don't view freezing as sort of the goal. It's it's really what to do with the excess. But stimulation protocols and freezing protocols have gotten so good now that we do end up with a, a surplus of cryopreserved embryos. There might come a time when cryopreservation is sort of the standard and you know fresh embryo transfer may not be an option in all patients. The, the lining of the uterus is very um, kind of hot after stimulation. It's seen a lot of estrogen and it's often um, you know very very contractile, very inflammatory. And um, sometimes putting back a cryopreserved embryo in a non-stimulated uterus is preferable to fresh embryo transfer. We're, I don't think we're, we're not courageous enough to do that as a first option anymore, but that's going to be the focus of, of research for the next few years. We really want to look at ways of optimizing embryo transfer because we feel that there are some fairly high quality embryos that just never get a chance to implant because the environment isn't right. Got it. Got it. We have a question here from Mary. She's asking what kind of lifestyle you should maintain immediately after an IVF cycle. Um, realistically, common sense, you know, like, um, you know, the, the embryo is, is safely stored after transfer. We make the analogy that it's, it's kind of like throwing a grain of sand into a football field. So, you know, lying about the house is not necessary. You're not going to jar the embryo out of the uterus. It's best to, you know, move around, be active, um, do things to decrease stress because we, we do know it's a very stressful time. But you don't really need to take too many special precautions. We advise people not to, you know, do things that increase their core body temperature. And generally anything that would be considered extreme, just, it just doesn't seem like a good idea. So, you know, I always say common sense prevails. Great. And Sarah has a question here. When the issue is male infertility, what's the lowest sperm count number you'd accept in order to do ICSI? Basically, we need one sperm cell for each egg. So, you know, as long as we can reliably get eight to 10 sperm cells, we can inject eight to 10 eggs. So as you know, they can number in the hundreds and we can do ICSI. Great. All right, we have some questions about the Blue Sky Project. Um, so um, Sahira, Sahira, I'm really hoping I'm saying that right. Um, she says, I believe you stated you were accepting 200 people for the whole year for the Blue Sky Project. Is that correct? No, we're gonna run it for a full year. Uh, we just know that our, our clinic's capacity is such that, um, you know, typically in that time frame we can handle about 200 cycles. Um, you know, we, we've tried to enlist more than one IVF laboratory so that, such that if volume becomes a problem, we can have options for people. Um, one of the stipulations in the project is that um, we can only offer the subsidy to people for two cycles. Um, so such that, you know, hopefully everyone will get an opportunity to take part. Great. Actually, we have two questions here. Um, the, sorry, the same question from two different people. Um, in terms of people participating in this, in the Blue Sky Project, um, how are these people determined? And, you know, we have another question from Sarah, she's wondering if it's if the program is going to create a long wait time for IVF at the clinic. 
Um, and she just has a concern that maybe the wait time is going to be long. Um, you know, we don't feel like it is uh, like it's going to be a huge issue. Um, you know, we do have measures to um, deal with wait times. Uh, it basically just means that we need to, you know, hold clinic more often and see people more quickly. Um, so that's sort of, you know, that's that's our problem. Good problem to have, I guess. Um, people aren't aren't going to be selected for this program. Like, you know. We like we talked about. Um, I had a you know long talk with Dr. Jeff Nisker after last month's webinar, and really, you know, deciding who gets help or who needs help isn't really appropriate. So we're opening up this program to anyone. You know, anyone who feels like they would benefit from some financial relief is going to be able to go through this program. So it's it's really you know it's open to everybody and um, anyone who feels like they can take advantage of it, we'd be more than happy to have them. Amazing, amazing. This question is from Jenna. Um, she's saying, how much should we save money wise to even start to think about starting a family with your lovely clinic? <laughs> hmm. I mean, I think what you need to do is is get yourself assessed. Um, IVF is not for everybody. And so there are still some very good provincially funded programs that people can um, take part in. Uh, as a lot of the, the people who've been following this series know, I do a lot of natural fertility therapy. I do a lot of metabolic counseling. Um, and I, like, I truly believe that the answer is different for everybody. Um, we know that there's a high proportion of people who will need IVF and who can't afford it. And that's really, you know, what this program is about, but I, you know, what we've done in the, the initial phase of the Blue Sky project is, if the traditional cost of a IVF cycle with medications is ten thousand, it's going to be available to people, including medications, at five thousand nine hundred. Um, so that's you know that's a full cycle of therapy, and I guess if you're looking for a starting point. That's what uh, it's going to be available with people through the program. That's amazing. That's great. We we have a we have a really great question actually um, from Leah again. Um, she's wondering if you're already at a fertility clinic and you've kind of gone through the investigation stage, um, so that's testing, cycle monitoring, etc. Um, and they come to Fertility Ontario. Do you think they're going to have to do all those tests again, or can information like that be transferred? Yeah. The they can be um, they can be done um, very easily. Like the we we do is just do a record release, and we do that all the time. I really like it's not useful to me to repeat things. Um, I do a few tests myself that um, that I like to do f on everybody. I, anyone who goes through IVF with me gets an AMH level um, because it's highly predictive of outcomes. And then we usually like to evaluate the uterus with either a camera or a sauna histogram just to make sure that it's um, acceptable for embryo transfer. But if you've had a previous, you know, basic workup from another clinic, we don't look to repeat that stuff because, you know, time is of the essence in this process. And if we waste your time, we're just keeping you from your goal. Great. We have another question here from Sayira. Um, she's saying, you know, if someone had a stillbirth after 36 weeks and did an IUI, would you recommend for the next pregnancy to do IVF or would you stick with IVI? Or sorry, I, IUI. You know, if someone's been pregnant through one modality before, I think it, I think it deserves a chance. Um, you know, you, you don't tend to mess with success. Um, you know, stillbirth is, is just a horrible thing for somebody to have to go through. But it has a low risk of recurrence, so I think that's something that, you know, you would meet with your doctor and decide together. It also depends on on age and and sort of what you think the window for fertility is for you. But again, you know, IVF is not for everybody. Um, one of the reasons that I I'm trying to employ IUI less is because when we use injectable medications in IUI, it actually contributes a lot of multiples into the system. So one of the ways that we can potentially save money as a society 
is to offer people an option like IVF that has a lower risk of multiple pregnancy than IUI. And you know that's that's something that um, is contentious, but realistically, the the greatest contribution of twins in the system doesn't come from IVF. It comes from low tech modalities like IUI. That's great. We don't have any other question in the question box, but if, if you have a question, um, you're wondering about a scenario, this is the opportunity to ask it. Um, any more questions about the Blue Sky Project or about a scenario that you're dealing with? Um, we're here to, to answer questions. So um, I'd love to give us just maybe another minute or two. Um, oh, good. Here they come. <laughs> um, let me see here. We uh, have a question from Misty. She says, how long has, um, how long has MESS, M-E-S-S, been around? What are long-term effects? Now, that might, M-E-S-S might be something I'm just not aware of. Does that make sense, John? Um, let me just. Are you going to the panel, too? No. Um, I, I think. Uh, I think. Oh, meds. I'm sorry. Meds. meds. She just yeah. So, <laughs> um, the purified meds and the recombinant meds have been around um, for about 20 years or so. And um, what do we know about long-term effects? Um, probably not the whole picture yet. Um, but in terms of risk you have to understand that these medications are taken for a very short period of time. When we look at, you know, risks for ovarian cancer, risk for breast cancer, risk of cardiovascular disease, the attributable risk is usually something that is, is you know, associated with a long-term exposure. So, you know, if you look at the artificial hormones that are in birth control pills um, or hormone replacement therapy, they're a much longer exposure than the amounts of estrogen that you see in a single IVF cycle. So things that cause prolonged exposure are probably going to trend out as being a greater lifetime risk than the brief exposure to high estrogen levels that we see from IVF medications. Um, you know, again, this is sort of conjecture, but nulliparity or the condition of, of never having a child carries with it some fairly significant health risks as well. Uh, we see higher rates of ovarian cancer, higher rates of breast cancer. So, you know, pregnancy is, is a healthy thing um, and you have to weigh, you know, perceived versus real risks. It's an excellent question and I think it's something that we, we can't just um, dismiss, but for now, fertility medications are thought to be very safe. Great. Um, let me see here. Um, we have a question here from Leah. She's saying, for someone living two hours away, and she's aware that the entire process takes a couple of days, will you need to spend a couple of days in London, or are there other affiliated clinics that you can go visit to get some of the procedures completed? Yeah, the um, it depends on, on what we're talking about. The um, with the Blue Sky Project, the um, you know we can have satellite work done by clinics that are closer to you, but typically they will charge you for it, um, and oftentimes the the costs that they will charge you will evaporate a lot of the cost savings in the project. Um, you know there are ways of of working around um, the number of visits depending on where you're coming from. Um, Typically, what we're, we look at is about um, five visits overall, um, three for monitoring and two for retrieval and transfer. And that's, you know, realistically, um, that's about the minimum that we're able to do. So depending on where you're coming from, we, we can enlist the help of a satellite clinic, but that might um, decrease some of the cost effectiveness of the program. Got it. Okay, great. And Sarah's saying, okay, so that's great. Um, we have a question here from Misty. She's saying, what is the lowest AMH level that's workable with IVF? Well, I mean, they've done IVF in people with 
you know, very low AMH levels. Um, workable is a loaded question. You know, once the AMH drops below five, um, we see less eggs retrieved, less embryos created. Um, the embryos that are created, they seem to have as much of a chance as any other, but they, um, you know, typically when we don't have the backup in terms of numbers, the pregnancy rates are low. Um, for my purposes, if your AMH is less than five, um, I really look at other modalities in order to try to achieve pregnancy. If your tubes are blocked or if you have severe endometriosis and we, we know that there aren't really any other options other than IVF, then yeah, we'll do it. But um, we, we just don't know what the outcome is going to be in that setting. Got it. Um, we have a question here from Pam, and it's about, it's a question regarding the one embryo transplant. She's saying for the Blue Sky Project, she's 35, would she still need to comply with only one embryo transferred, or would it go up to two? Yeah, at the age of 35, um, in most cases, I would transfer one embryo. Um, it depends on whether or not we had day three embryos or day five embryos and depends on overall prognosis. If, you know, if the prognosis was guarded, then, you know, you might cajole me into two embryos, but not likely. It's just, it doesn't make sense in a 35-year-old patient. Um, every scenario is different, so we can't use age as the only indicator, but, um, it's 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 something that you know the patient and the doctor would have to work together on. Um, at the, like at the end of the day, um, you know, if I don't think it's medically appropriate to put back two embryos, I don't really have any obligation to the patient to do that um, because it's still a medical service, regardless of whether or not people are paying for it. Mm -hmm. um, this is a really great question from Heather. Do you have plans to potentially to potentially extend the Blue Sky project beyond its initial one-year plan for those individuals who perhaps cannot access it directly after launch? That's a good question. You know what? If um, if it doesn't cause us to go out of business, we'll probably keep running it. Um, <laughs> you know, it is so lean from a dollars and cents standpoint that um, you know we'll see how long we're able to do it. Um, you know, it's it's a huge financial sacrifice on behalf of the clinic, um, but we we think that it it is going to work towards something more important. Um, but if if our volume goes up and if we're doing more cycles at less cost, maybe you know maybe we will do okay, and in that case we would keep running it. That's great. That's really good. And and I I also think you know. Being able to give the government a deadline, you know, a timeline to say, you know, here, here's what Fertility Ontario is doing, you know, to, to generate information and to make this available for people, you know, giving the government a timeline is also important. So I, at the same time, I still really think that having that deadline is important just to show the government that it's kind of their turn too to step up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, that's really um you know, what this is about is, is that for all sides, it's basically, um, you know, putting your money where your mouth is, right? Um, we've, we've talked at great length. Um, we've, we've looked at the data. We've brought on speakers. Everyone's had their opportunity to talk, talk, talk. But what we need now is some action, right? And that's on behalf of the clinics, on behalf of the patients, and on behalf of government. Mm -hmm. We have another question here from Nicole. She says, are there any benefits in using naturopathic, homeopathic treatments while you're in an IVF cycle? Probably. I mean, you know, we use a lot of um, coenzyme Q10 in our IVF cycles as a, as a pretreatment and throat stimulation. And that's an antioxidant that can be found in, in many natural forms, including grapeseed extract. There's also a lot of um, naturally available um, anti-inflammatories and antioxidants. So, you know, consulting with a naturopath is uh, is always a, a good option. Um, 
oftentimes if you can get your whole body healthy, you'll do better throughout any process. That's great. That's actually all the questions that are here. And again, if there's questions that, you know, you still have kind of burning, um, please ask them. We are here. I know, I know it's after nine o'clock, but sometimes our webinars do run a little bit over, but this is our opportunity to get all of our questions answered. Um, you said, just see, we had another question just pop in. Um, oh yeah. So basically Leah just said that she's kind of scheduled for some acupuncture sessions. Um, so that'll be really interesting. John, do you have any, you know, any information if you think acupuncture makes a difference? I know naturopathic medicine is something that is still. No, acupuncture actually, um, you know, trends out in the literature as being helpful. Um, particularly around the time of embryo transfer. Um, you know, it's in small numbers, it's very hard to prove that pregnancy rates go up, but we do find that patients who undergo acupuncture are more relaxed and tolerate the procedures a lot better. Got it. Got it. We have a qu another question here from Misty. She says, is egg retrieval all that bad? Should I be worried about risks? Um, Egg retrieval is, is not a lot of fun. Um, you know, we, we use conscious sedation and we use local anesthesia, but we're talking about putting a needle into an area of the body that is that has a lot of nerve endings, right? Um, some people breeze through it, other people do not. Um, everyone gets through it, right? Because it's, you know, it's eminently safe and it's done by very highly skilled professionals. Um, it's not something that you should worry about. I think a lot of people do kind of fake themselves out a little bit about it because it's a relatively quick procedure and you know you're under some very potent medications for it. Um, the best thing you can do is find somebody who's been through it and see what their experience was like because it's not horrible for everybody. Got it. Um, got it, got it. We have a question here from Alvin. He says, what is the current cost of IVF at your clinic? Um, currently, our base price is forty five hundred, and then with meds, it um, you know most people will spend about three thousand dollars on meds. So, and then with an orientation fee, it's about eight or nine thousand on the whole. Got it. Got it. We have another question here from Jenna. She says we're coming to the clinic in June for our first ever appointment. Is there a cost to that? No, no, I, a lot of people aren't aware of this, but, you know, consultation, diagnostics, even ultrasounds are covered by the Ministry of Health. The only thing that they don't cover is in vitro fertilization. So as soon as you enter into an IVF cycle, suddenly your doctor's visits and, and ultrasounds and such um, are no longer covered. But it's, um, you know, during the initial consultation phase and diagnosis, everything's covered by the Ministry of Health. That's great. That's really good. Um, and we have another question pop in from Leah. Leah, thanks for asking so many great questions because I know these are really benefiting everyone joining us. Um, she says, does 5900 include the entire procedure, drugs, IVF, you know, the whole kit and caboodle? Yes. Everything but cryopreservation. Awesome. Very, very awesome. Um, that's really great. Um, I just want to share with you, um, John, some of the great comments that are coming in. Um, Mary says that she's really thankful for this program and she's able to try an IVF cycle because of this project. She's really thankful for all the efforts and, and, um, and there's been a number of comments that have come in like that. And, and I, I just want to share those with you because you really are giving your time pro bono. And this is a really big project that I know from kind of the background that we've been discussing for a long time. So I want to acknowledge you and for Shilling Ontario for, you know, I guess without a better phrase, putting, you know, taking some action and putting kind of your money uh, where your mouth is and taking a really big step for what I think is women's health and what really should be funded. And I really hope that out of this program, the government is able to, to see the, the, the benefits here for them, both for people and for financial, because of course, people always look at the financial too, but this really makes a big difference for families. Well, we're hoping so, but um, you know, we have a year 
Um, it's a lot of work to be done, and uh, we'll see what we can do. Um, you know, until the program meets its goals, it's just a concept. So, you know, we're very excited to get to work, and hopefully, we'll we'll reach the ultimate goal, which is you know to make it such that programs like this don't need to exist. Anyway. I have got to run everybody, uh, but thank you for hanging out with me tonight. Um, I look forward to seeing some of you in the clinic, and thanks so much for your attention. Okay, take care, everyone. Good night.